Hey, Drew. Hey, Drew, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, perfect. Loud and clear. This is great. How are you doing? I'm pretty good, man. How you been? Good, good. Good to be back in America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, were, you were stuck for how long? Uh, well, our season ended, kind of ended in March. So I was stuck there through like mid-May. But they okay. didn't officially cancel the season until like the beginning of May. So we were kind of just like waiting around for a while, even though like Bundesliga and other France and all them canceled pretty early. And then yeah. we kind of got stuck. But Which was very good. strange too, because Spain mm -hmm. at, at that particular time was uh, really struggling with with COVID. Right. Yeah, it was like one of the worst countries. And <laughs> I think we all kind of knew the writing written on the wall, but financially and other reasons, they tried to hold on as long as they could. So. Sure, sure, sure. But yeah. Well, now, well, welcome back home, I guess. Thanks. Now, do you feel safer uh, back home? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, in the past <laughs> couple of weeks, I don't know. <laughs> but. <laughs> yeah, it's been a very, very strange time. But, you know, yeah. as always, we will prevail and we'll, right. we'll, we'll do a good thing. So exactly. first, Drew. Thanks for joining me at uh, Straight Handball Talk. Uh, so what this show, this show came out of actually COVID. One benefit of having time and being stuck at home is you sort of think about uh, why do I like handball so much? Why do I spend so much time about it? And, and the fact is that uh, those relationships that I have built because of this sport throughout my, my life, uh, whether in US or back home in Kosovo, are the best relationships that I have. And, and they're always the closest ones. So, and it's not because necessarily, you know, I don't have other friendships, but the ones with handball are, are very different. They're just a lot closer. And the sport itself is as such uh, that really bonds people together. So that's why I started this to talk to people that I know from all around the world and just bring this to the surface because we all know that especially us americans in, in us uh, it's the biggest benefit we get i mean we're yeah. not professional players i mean you are doing something phenomenal which we will talk about it but uh, ultimately it's like this is something that hey i love being around these people because they're one good people too the sport itself is about that trust and, and real reliability and teamwork so i i'm grateful that you're joining me in this show and uh, i'm happy that you are sort of the face of uh, U.S. handball right now and for for the next decade or so because you're still young. So uh, first thing I'm going to ask you is, and I know there were a bunch of articles um, about you recently, but how did you get started with handball the first time you touched the ball and the first time you said, okay, this game fits me? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Well, before I answer, I just want to say thanks for having me on been able to follow this podcast a little bit it's been pretty cool to see all the the broad range of people you have on there so honored to be to be on here but um to answer your question yeah so i started playing um so i went to the air force academy i started in 2011 i entered in june um and growing up i played a lot of different sports football basketball and baseball primarily kind of like a typical american you know uh kid who was into sports and things yeah. like that and so came from a high school really big high school in Minnesota. We had a really good football program. So I played there. I was a little bit undersized, uh, kind of hard to believe now, but I was, I was kind of, a, I was definitely a late bloomer. Um, and so I came in as a freshman at the Academy around six, three and like 180 pounds, pretty small relative to where I am now. But, um, so I went to the football walk on tryout, not with high expectations, but you know, just cause it was kind of a dream of mine. And the coaches there kind of said, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Maybe next year, um, but at the academy, sports are a huge deal, and uh, everyone who goes there has to play a sport, whether that's at the intramural level or the varsity level. Yeah. Um, they have a ton of club sports there because a lot of the cadets that go there come from athletic backgrounds, competitive people, obviously, and the academy had a lot of resources to help with that. So um, after I got cut from the football team, I went down, I like looked at the list of club sports, and I said, handball, what's that? You know, I think I might have played that in gym class. So I did, looked on some YouTube videos. I was like, oh, that looks pretty cool. So I went down and fell, fell in love with it almost instantly. It's kind of kind of crazy. And Mike Cavanaugh was our coach. And, you know, he's got a long history with USA Handball as a player and a coach. And he kind of took me under – I attribute a lot of it to him because he really took me under his wing when I got there um, and gave me a lot of opportunities as a first-year player that uh, kind of developed into – that kind of 
spurred me on and my love for the game and um, got a couple opportunities to play with the junior national team while I was there and that just kind of kept me going. Um, and yeah, so that's how it all started was at the academy. So, so we should uh, uh, we should thank the that football coach in that academy. That uh, exactly. Yeah. We should give him, send him a letter. USA team member should send a letter. And say, hey, dude, thank you for rejecting him because we just got <laughs> something special in handball. So that that's good. That's a good uh, a good story. And of course, uh, I love Mike Cavanaugh. I know yeah. Mike since I've been involved in handball because he's been involved in handballs. Who knows since when? Um, <laughs> And the truth is, there is no more special person that can get people to enjoy the real elements of handball culture than Mike. Yeah, absolutely. And he, I mean, he kind of instilled that in us from day one. You know, every day he comes in with a random shirt from some Olympic Games in like the 70s or some random world championships. And he'd always have a story. Yeah. And you could tell that like, you know, his love for the game is genuine, you know, and all he wanted to do was kind of instill that in us. And, um, you know, obviously we know as American players, there's a lot of challenges with playing handball organizationally and things like that. Um, you know, you're scrambling for gym time, you know, you're traveling, pouring a lot of your own money in it, but he really set the example of, you know, what love for the game is. And I think that kind of poured out into the rest of us and really kept us going. And he, you know, really valued the camaraderie part of it, always had us over at his house on the weekends and things yeah. like that. So um that was a huge part of, of that experience yeah that's i i i really can usually connect in this straight handball talk i keep asking even the guys like like Vranesh or kim or or vid how did they start because ultimately you know there's that one person that gets them started there's one person that pushes them and influences them to stay with the sport because for us in us this is not a common sport. It's not a, uh, you can go and pick up a game anywhere you want to. It's none of us would actually choose it if we were not introduced to someone uh, by someone who really loves this sport. So yeah, I, I think it's important to have someone like Mike. And, and I remember, I, I'm, I don't have a very clear vision of what really happened and whether you were the one who scored that winning goal uh, of Air Force against New York City in that semifinal match in Nationals. Yeah, no, that wasn't me, but I was on the court when that happened. You were on the court. So, and, and I remember I had a bet with Mike Cavanaugh before. We were like, okay, if, if uh, whoever wins uh, between us has to pay beers to each other. <laughs> and, and obviously the game was really intense and interesting. And then the last second was like four seconds to go. Uh, you guys had the ball from the middle court, mid court. I remember I'm telling my guys, get back. For some reason, they just went out like man to man in a, in a or halfway court, and then boom, the ball was thrown sort of like alley oop. In yeah, in it was court. like an alley oop play. Yeah. yeah, and the last second goal, I was like, I can't believe it. I looked at Mike, I was laughing because I'm like, I can't believe it. I have to pay him beer. Yeah. <laughs> that that was a good game. Yeah, I mean that was one of my fondest memories. Like that's a real vivid memory that I have of playing. I think that was my senior year and. Yeah, but you guys were great, too, because I think it was just such like a pure handball moment where, you know, you guys realized it was such a crazy play. And <laughs> you guys were all great sports after, too, you know. And yeah, yeah but I just remember go, like going right to Mike after that. Yeah. Him a big hug. Was, it was it was I mean, I love those games, obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah for you guys, you won. You went to the finals uh, um, and for our guys. You learn a lesson. I mean, right. you just don't stop playing to the last second and right. stuff like this can happen. So yeah. I still remember that. I was a, as a coach on that team. So it was, it was great, a lesson for me. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, some technical and tactical aspects because uh, when people look at the sport from the outside, uh, it, it looks like it's easy, right? You know, people right. look, oh, well, doesn't doesn't look that hard, but for you switching from other sports to handball, how difficult it was for you to adapt to handball movements on the court? Because obviously you are, you are the perfect size for the modern handball player, but movements on the handball court are very different than any other sport. So how, yeah. how difficult was that for you? Yeah, it was tricky at the start because my background was basketball and football. Um, and so basketball, you can take you know, one step when you're pivoting, whereas handball, you got three. So that was like a real, I remember that being a really awkward transition to start. Um, but then I just, I remember taking a lot of reps, do a lot of left back. I played left back in college mostly, but that was, you know, 
doing a lot of reps with Mike before and after practice, to just kind of getting that, those steps down. And a lot of our guys were basketball players too on the Air Force Academy team. So it was something we worked on as a team a lot too. Um, but yeah, and then I think the throwing motion was a little different too. You know, I was a quarterback in football, so it was a little bit different. A baseball background combination of the two. Um, and then get, obviously getting used to stick on something like really random. they would never really played with before in any sport other than, you know, on a baseball bat. But um, yeah, and then I think as like my progression as a player has gone, playing at different higher and higher levels, it just becomes more and more exposed. You know, the fact that it's not natural movements. I didn't start playing as a seven-year-old, you know, like probably you did or other other guys who come from Europe where it's a much bigger sport and they have better youth programs. Um, but I think as American players, we sometimes or oftentimes make up for it in athleticism or try to make up for it in athleticism. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, look it's, uh, you know, with your height uh, um, and you, of course, your physical abilities that you have, you were, you were torn between backcourt because you played in national u.s national league so it, it definitely there's no question that you could definitely play uh, backcourt however you want to but now you're you're transitioning you have transitioned into the pivot position is that because of your beach handball background or is it because someone else guided you to do that um it kind of started before that um i think as soon as i started getting involved with the national team we realized you know we had guys like abu fufana and some of these guys who had experience in Europe and it was pretty clear, you know, that my skill level was much lower than theirs and the, the transition to pivot was a lot easier, especially as I got bigger. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say it necessarily had to do with the beach that was just kind of ran like the timing kind of worked with that. But um, yeah, and at first I was a little resistant to it because you know, okay. I was more comfortable in a left back position. But as soon as I got a little more international experience, it was pretty clear to me that, you know, I need to transition to pivot you know, for the betterment of the team and just for my skill set and, you know, playing a left, playing a backcourt position is much more technical, obviously, yeah. than playing pivot. So that was the main reason. That, how, how difficult it is for you right now? Like, uh, because you, I, in my opinion, uh, anyone who gets involved in handball and is athletic enough and also knows how to play other sports, there is a, a, a instant uh, learning curve in handball. So you just kind of went like, whew, pretty quickly learn almost everything about this sport. But now you are in that difficult phase, which lasts for a long time, being very specific in, in building those skills. What are the biggest challenges for you right now when you're learning that pivot position? I think uh, just the speed of the game combined with the nuances that go with that. Every day I feel like I'm learning something new and Every day I'm also realizing how much I don't know. Um, and I'm fortunate to play for Manolo Cadenas in, in Spain, who's one of the best coaches in the world. And, yeah. and he's great at exposing those things <laughs> to me um, and then showing me drills and things I can do to improve. So it's, we talk about details every day. And I think the higher you go up, the more the details matter um, because at that level, you know, everybody's a similar size and athleticism and, a lot of guys have experience, but for me personally, I don't have as much experience as those guys. So I kind of have to spend even more time and effort working on those small details to, to kind of compensate. Yeah, my, I, look, uh, it's an amazing sport. And I say, I mean, too bad that like, I guess with everything else, the older you get, the more the game becomes easier. Like, uh, like you see the game and, and you understand like, why didn't I think about this when I was 23 years old? I was fast, but I didn't have to go that fast. Like, right. It didn't make a difference. So now you realize that because physically, I mean, I'm talking from a personal aspect, I cannot run that fast, but I know how to put myself in a position to compensate for that. So I'm like, why didn't I know this before? Why didn't yeah. I do this before? So, but with time, and that is with a lot of games and with a lot of, uh, good people around uh, it just the game becomes easier and easier um, and more fun I, I think it's even more right fun. yeah and I think handball is unique too where you see a lot of guys at the high level at a little bit older you know we had on my team in particular we had Gonzalo Carew who's the captain of the Argentinian yeah. team he's 40 years old and he just won best defensive player in the Spanish <laughs> league you know and it's like it's pretty crazy, but that's not uncommon for the sport either. You know, you got like Karabatic and these other guys that are playing into their late 30s. And, 
Um, it's pretty cool to see, but like you just said, and I mean, and you probably see it as your own personal experience is like, you're seeing so much more of the game now and you know, you can use those things to, to beat these young guys too. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. I, I love it. I'm like, okay, well, it just does, don't, I don't have to be fast. I just have to know where to be right. <laughs> or anyone else. So, but uh, you are a, obviously a trained military man. Uh, most people know that U.S. military doesn't joke around when it comes to preparing their people. So do you think military men or, and women are the most equipped people to become handball players? Because I do. Okay. Uh, <laughs> saying the most equipped, I don't know, that might be a, a bold statement, but I think there are definitely a lot of carryovers between the two. Um, kind of the discipline and um, yes. the work ethic and, you know, the thing for me, I think the biggest lesson I've learned in my military experience that's carrying over to my experience in Spain right now is kind of the importance of like listening to authority and, <laughs> and learning from authority because, you know, I'm in a very like uncomfortable position over there, you know, I'm learning a sport at a higher level than I'm used to, maybe a higher level than I was really ready for, combine that with a language barrier and you know all these people that have way more experience than me and so learning how to find my role there uh learn from them every day while still being able to compete or trying to compete at that same level during practice um has been somewhat of a challenge but like a fun a fun challenge for me and i think my experience through the academy and my military experience of being in a lot of uncomfortable situations has prepared me well for that yeah. but you know that's that's a part that sometimes I, I, I look at all the young or, or ambitious American handball players, they all want playtime right away. And, and the culture of handball, especially when you're, you're around really good players, is this, like sitting on the bench and learning from the bench and being a part of that whole uh, movement without actually saying, hey, I want to play because right. your time will come. But it's so hard for us in, in US because, hey, I'm here. I want to play. I'm here to play. Right. But, but like you said, with military, with the discipline, with authority, it's like, you know what? You got to be ready for when you're called and then you're in. And then yeah. you just show how much you really cared and what you learn about it. So uh, people need to be patient. And European clubs will teach you that because they will not put you in the game, even if you're the best player in, the, in that team. But if you just showed up, they're going right. to let you learn that gradual part of being a team. So, yeah. And one other aspect that I didn't mention too that you kind of hinted at was like, you know, being ready from when, for when your number's called. You know, it's a team game, so there's a lot of crazy things happen, and you never know when you're going to be needed. And exactly. an example for that for me came pretty quickly. We were in the we were playing against Barcelona for the first time in November, and you know, Manolo had kind of hinted that I was probably going to get some playing time like later in the game. I hadn't played much yet in the season; I was still kind of getting my feet under me. And uh, it was in the first half, and he said get going. I was like, well, you know, <laughs> but it comes back to, you know, you never know. You got to be ready for your teammates. You know, got to be ready to contribute when, when your time is called. So yeah, that, that must have been a good, uh, good feeling for you against like the craziest team in the world that just, they never stop running and moving and adapting. And just like, it's, it's, it's insane. What kind of team that is. Yeah. And the depth too, you know, they <laughs> sub a guy out, they sub, you know, they sub whoever out, like, Roll and Trieros out, and then you got Los Angeles coming in. You know, it's like nonstop. But I'll never forget that morning of that game. We played it at our place. That morning we went in for film like we normally do on game day. And they were all the, – the varsity team was training on the court, and I walked in, and I was just like kind of starstruck. You know, I saw Deacon Mem first. It's like, man, I've watched hours of YouTube videos of this guy, and he's like right there, you know, like almost wasn't real. But, uh, but yeah, like you said, just yeah. crazy, crazy team. So Yeah. Yeah, so what, what happens – I know it's not coming anytime soon, uh, but what happens when you need to go back to work and serve your country? Yeah, so I'm scheduled to go. So fortunately, I was able to extend another season into next year. I wasn't sure if that was going to happen. This program that I'm in right now is normally a two-year deal and ends kind of with the Olympic cycle. Most athletes go back, work for a year or two, and then if they're lucky, they can get accepted in the program again if they're still competitive. Um, but with the COVID stuff, uh, they ended up extending a lot of us athletes that were in the program with the delay of the Olympics. So that was, I was super fortunate to have that happen. So, um, yeah, the only thing guaranteed right now is to be able to stay in the program through next season. And then 
we'll kind of see what happens. I'm scheduled to come back. I got fortunate too. I got a set up with an assignment back in Los Angeles. So um, worst what, case scenario. Can, can, you be, say, can you say it again? What happened in Los Angeles? Um, so I got set up with a follow on assignment. So my job will be back here in Los Angeles oh, okay, um, good. after next season, which is great for me in terms of beach handball. I'll be able to continue training and competing with that team and hopefully with the LA club, but we'll, we'll kind of see what happens. A lot's still up in the air and, I've kind of learned to not expect anything because a lot of a lot of crazy things have happened just in the last two years that I never really planned. So just trying to control what I can control and do the best I can in the situations I'm put in and then kind of yeah. see what happens. Of course, the best way, the best way. Uh, but okay, and you man mentioned beach handball and um, to me, they're completely two different sports and, yeah. and, I personally find beach handball more difficult physically, at least for me right now, the, the last few years. And, and the game has a lot less thinking about it, but uh, it requires some specific athleticism to, to achieve success. Um, which one do you prefer more? I actually get that question kind of a lot, but I think, and I kind of have a cop-out answer that I like them both <laughs> for different reasons, because I think, the atmosphere of beach and kind of the creativity of it is a lot of fun. You know, who doesn't like playing on a beach with, you know, music playing and the culture is a little more laid back and um, it's fun, but I definitely love the, the physicality of, you know, regular handball and I'm with you. I think they're very different sports and I have suggested to some people that they almost should have different names because they're, they're really not the same sport at all. But, um, and I really don't, Think there's a whole lot of carryover between the two of them in turn and besides like throwing Spring but goal. even that's yeah. different yeah so i just feel fortunate i'm able to do both but i don't think there is really a lot of a whole lot of carryover between the two yeah i i, I love watching it and i love playing i played a few times and it was fun but i was getting so tired i just didn't understand why my body was not prepared for that sort of thinking and movement yeah like it's it's so quick handball indoor handball is fast but not as fast as beach handball when you really want to play at that level so right. it's so much fun to watch um and i wish i really wish and hope one day we're going to try to build something on the beach handball in on the east coast yeah sort of start building some sort of a, a competition between east and west because right now everything's happening on the west coast yeah no that'd be great it'd be phenomenal so uh Talking about your Pan Am Games experience last year in Peru, um, I watched a bunch of the games, uh, and and of course the biggest thing that happened there, in my opinion, well, the two biggest things that happened, in my opinion, one, um, watching you guys play with a new coach was great because he he simplified the game, and I, I really love what he does with the system, and two, beating Cuba, which has not happened, I think, either. 20 years or 30 years or, or whatever. It was huge. It was big. So what was your feeling as, as one, as an individual, but also as a team starting to believe that, Hey, we have a chance now. Yeah. Well, I think before it even started, I was happy just to be on the roster because we had, especially at the pivot position, we're really deep. Um, uh, we're not that way with a lot of other positions, but with pivot, I think we had about five guys that could have easily been selected and, Thankfully, they brought, brought three. And kind of going back to our conversation about being ready is, you know, I wasn't really expecting a lot of playing time. You know, I was playing behind Patrick Huger, who plays in the second Bundesliga and strong player, and then Doma, who played in the Bundesliga before that. Uh, so I was just happy to be on the team, you know. And, but, you know, in training camp, both Patrick and Doma got hurt. We were there six days beforehand. We were in Brazil before that, and we got there six days early and we had practice, and both of them got hurt in training. Yeah. And so I was like, crap, I got to be ready to go. <laughs> um, but yeah, and kind of your comments about Robert, I think he's, you know, the perfect guy for the job, the USA job right now, because obviously he's got tremendous experience and, you know, as a player and as a coach. Yeah. Um, but I think he's, really does a great job of balancing his because we all know he's got way more knowledge probably than he's imparting on us necessarily or you know but he definitely brings it down to a level that you know is palatable for us as american players with less experience and he does a great job of kind of tying everything together setting smaller goals you know for us to reach rather than kind of like in the military we use this saying sometimes is like the best way to 
to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. And I think he, <laughs> he does that really well. And it, it showed for us at the Pan Am Games because we came in, you know, we knew we had a tough group. We had Chile, who was traditionally the third best team behind, shortly behind Argentina and Brazil. Yeah. We had Argentina and Cuba. We were like, man, we'll be lucky. We weren't saying this, but like kind of in our heads, we're like, man, we'll yeah, be lucky yeah. to, to win a game, you know, in the group play. Um, maybe maybe squeak out too if something crazy happened with Chile. But, um, but yeah, the Cuba game was incredible. You know, we came in. We actually came in. We played Argentina first, and we came out strong in the first half. Yeah. We were hanging with them. And then obviously their experience and talent level kind of surpassed as the game went on. But um, I think that game kind of gave us some confidence, at least for part of it. And then yeah. Cuba, we just kind of hung around and, you know, were able to close it out at the end. But, uh, but yeah, I think overall it was a good step forward. You know, we hadn't been to the Pan Am Games in two cycles. It was, I think it was a good foundation. We got a lot of young players too. So it was a good, good confidence boost and foundation for going forward. Yeah, I, I, I loved it, actually, you know, for a long, in a long time, I didn't feel hopeful watching the U.S. national team because it just felt there was no system, there was no style, or at least it looked completely off at times, but now it's like you watch and you have, you have a system, you have a simple game being played because that's what we need at, at, at right now, and then just take advantage of all, each player's uh, abilities to to perform at the highest that they can. Because, I mean, we cannot ask any of the players to do more than they can. But if they are in a system where they can do the right thing and most important thing, not make a lot of mistakes, it was it was great to watch. I really enjoyed it. it I, and I think it's, it's a really good group of guys. And hopefully everyone stays healthy and stays together for a long time mm -hmm. because yeah. it's the best time for U.S. Yeah. national team. So one – question now with Ad, uh, Adam Leon. I know you are you have till next year and then after that year would you consider switching a club to another pro club in Europe if you could continue with the world athlete program um it's hard to say right now because I've had such a great experience in Leon, and you know I feel honored just to be selected because that was actually another story I was going to mention about that whole thing happened while we were in Peru. Yeah. Uh, we had played three games. We had like a day break. Uh, we were in the gym working out like the weight room and Robert came up to me and said, you know, do you have a contract with Dormagen, which is a team I played with in Germany before. Um, and he kind of, he knew my situation. He was just kind of double checking. And I was like, yeah. no, I don't know the program that I'm in, but you know, I was planning on going back there for the following season. And he said, well, um, there's a team in Spain that wants, wants you. We're going to have a meeting tomorrow with the coach. Um, it's Ademar Le Leon. And I, was, I, th I kind of thought it was a joke at first. I was like, <laughs> really? You know? So I like, did some research on it. I was like, wow, this is, this is going to be a pretty incredible opportunity. And it turned out they were really trying to get Ian Huter, who already had a contract. So he was unavailable. But I okay. um, had a meeting with Manolo. It was Manolo, uh, Robert, and a few other people. And... Manolo is basically giving me like a recruiting pitch to come to Leon. And I was like, I don't, you don't really need to convince me. <laughs> you know, like, this is pretty incredible. So tournament ended, I flew back to Germany, got my stuff and then was back in Leon two days later. And it was all kind of a whirlwind, but, um, oh, I, I know this. I, I know, uh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I know the story very well because you know, they messed up my plans. They they took you away from from me and and the opportunity to play at Superglow because <laughs> not not a lot of people know this, but uh, you were supposed to join us at uh, in Saudi Arabia and Superglow while you were there in in Peru. But then Mark told me like, oh well, just or no, you told me like, oh I have this opportunity with uh, Real Ademar. I'm like, oh my lord, how can you? I cannot compete with that. So like, <laughs> and especially for the whole year, but. I remember the story very well, and I was I was really happy that you had that opportunity. It was great, even though you would have had a great time in Saudi Arabia too. Yeah, I was like, I mean, it was kind of bittersweet away because I remember we were texting. I think during during the tournament in Peru, and you're like, yeah. yeah, we'd love to have you. I was like, wow, it'd be an incredible opportunity to go. And I was like, oh man. And I remember watching the games too. I was like, man, that looks so awesome. But yeah, yeah no. so. Well, that's good that you your opportunities just kind of open up, and I yeah. think it's important. And, but. Does, does that make you feel a little bit, I, again, I should not say this because I don't think any military man 
feels pressure. You're taught to to work under serious pressure. So, <laughs> but you are you are now the face and and uh, the the future story of USA Handball. Does it put any pressure on you? Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily pressure, but I, I I don't know if I'm the face of handball, but I do recognize that you know I've I've got a pretty incredible opportunity and. Um, you know, I'm just one guy and my, my kind of goal with this whole deal is to really kind of pave a way for more American players to get over there because I think if a club like Audemar, you know, recognizes that an American player can contribute, might not be the star player, might not contribute a ton of goals or whatever, but, you know, is a good guy to have in the club, works hard, you know, and sets a good example and um, pushes his teammates and things like that because, you know, I think a lot of these clubs just need to be exposed to the fact that there are a few American players that, that can play, you know, they just need the right training. And I think Audemar was a perfect place to go because Manola is um, an excellent coach and yeah. especially with younger players. And while I'm not necessarily a younger player, my skill level might is more towards yeah. what a younger player would be. And he's excellent at developing those skills. And so my, my biggest hope with all this is that, you know, it doesn't end with me that there's more players that are playing over in Europe and playing EHF cup and champions league eventually. And, um, because I def I think it's no secret that we have the athletes that can do it. It's just, the, it's just fitting them into the right situations and taking advantage of the right opportunities. So what, what would you say to any hopeful American young one right now that, uh, is considering to, to play a sport, not when they're 25, 27, but when they're like, 18, 19, 20. It's like, how would you sell this sport to them from your perspective? Yeah, for me, it was like the perfect combination of every sport that I loved, you know? And so that was a big selling point for me. And at the time too, I wasn't a division one athlete. So it was kind of the next best thing. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't encourage, especially the younger players, I wouldn't encourage them just to sell out for handball right away, but keep it in the rotation of the other sports that they're playing, because I think there's definitely is an advantage to having multi-sport background, yeah. but at some point you've got to focus on the skills and things like that. But I think the biggest lesson for those young guys is, you know, be ready to take advantage of an opportunity when it presents itself, because that's kind of been the story of my whole journey is like, you know, there's a lot of unexpected things that have happened, but be ready for when that time comes and go all in once you have those opportunities and kind of don't look back. Yeah, and and I, I really think um, you and the rest of the young uh, American players who are playing handball right now, whether they're in Europe or here, uh, have a really great opportunity because with the wild cards given to USA for 2025, 2027, of course, leading to uh, LA 28, it has never been a better opportunity to really go all in. Right. And, and I, I'm, I know there's movement, uh, uh, but it's still very tiny movements. And I think, how can we get more of guys like you, like another 2,000 of them? Not, not the guys who come at 27, 28, 9 years old and they want to switch from one sport to another because it's, it's going to be very challenging, very challenging. Right. But the ones that were strong, they're, they're willing to be a part of the team, but they are young enough to learn the next five years. How do we do it? Yeah, well, I think they're already starting to do it. And Robert's been a great advocate for this, working to place guys in clubs. There's a couple, they've got a couple different initiatives going. They're still in the early stages. Um, but from what I've been hearing is they're, they're working hard to try to identify college players in the U.S. to go. Granted, we, we obviously ideally would want younger than that. But yeah. I think that's a start, you know, to get guys over there and um, just get them into a system like, you know, any of these clubs have great second teams. And that's, that's kind of how I started, too. I went into Dormagen with not a lot of expectations. Got, was fortunate to play with their second team, got 60 minutes a game with their second team, and then trained every day with their first team. You know, it was a lot of work, but it was probably the best thing I could have done. And um, All it takes, really, is just the right club to, to be open to it because, you know, a lot of these clubs, you know, they've got a lot going on. They got a lot to worry about. And, you know, the last thing a lot of them want to do is take extra time to develop an American player necessarily. But I think there are clubs out there that are willing to take a shot. And, yeah. you know, as long as the, the player is willing to, to get over there and, and to, to give it their best shot, then I think it can be the right, 
that match. No, I, I think that's great for those who can, because obviously your situation is different uh, in that sense because yeah. of of the way you're connected with the military world athlete program. But also another thing that I always believe is that we have some clubs in USA that have a, a handball uh, foundation that they understand what to do with developing players. And I think that could be another opportunity. So let's say we in New York City, you know, we, we have people from 56 different countries and we have in a way produced seven national team players. Um, but we could be a great hub for the initially actually training people who want to be uh, ammo players. And then when they learn the fundamentals of the sport within our system, then they can go and do the whole thing that you're doing right now. But there is no thought about putting effort in, in that aspect yet in USA because there are certain clubs that can do that. Um, yeah, I think you, you're spot on. I think especially, I think you guys would be a perfect example of that where you've got, you're in a huge city with, you know, a great reach and you already have a great reputation as a solid club and you have experienced coaches like yourself that are willing to, to put in the effort to help train these young athletes, give them a foundation that's yeah. solid enough to get them over there. And then, you know, all it takes is one opportunity to, to yeah. get them over there and, and play. But obviously it's, it's easy to talk about, but there are a lot of moving parts involved. But I think having guys like Robert Heaton and, you know, Stefan Olson that recognize that that's needs to be the answer is, yeah. is a good start. So. Yeah. Yeah, like all I need is a, a dedicated gym. I was speaking to Mark Ortega. Just I just need a gym. That's it. Honestly, I don't need anything else. Can somebody just make me a gym and then handball gym and 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 we'll take care of everything else. So which is mm, impossible in New York City to to have your dedicated gym, but hopefully one day, one day. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, Drew. I mean, I'm not going to take too much of your time. Um. Um. I, I really hope your handball career doesn't stop at all uh, until you decide to. And I hope you can continue training with these big clubs. And obviously, you know, if, if there's anything we can do here in New York City uh, to help your journey, I know you don't need it, but uh, you're always welcome to, to stop by if you're in New York for a little workout or, or playing against us. Even though the last few, few times we played against each other, I remember... Uh, need some redemption. <laughs> That was actually that was a good tournament. I forgot to talk about the Lake Placid one that we competed yeah. against each other. That was a good time, and I'm glad that we beat you guys. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. It was a great. It was awesome. I think, especially for like a first tournament of that caliber, I thought it went really smooth and really well. Yeah, obviously, which wish the outcome was a little different from my side, but it was it was a great great tournament. are doing awesome stuff in new york and it's cool to cool to watch from afar to see all the things that are happening and i think you said it right with the national team we're in a great spot in terms of moving forward but i think clubs too you know especially new york city and cali in particular are ones that are really investing in the youth i can tell and, yeah you know, are looking towards the future and not just right now so which is what we need so yeah. hats off to you guys for all the work that you guys are doing because you know, it's, it's not sexy all the time. You know, there's not a lot, there's no money in it. You know, you're not doing it for that. And so, uh, which, which I think we talked about earlier too, is the cool part about the sport, because I think that's why the relationships are so strong is because, you know, no one in the States is getting paid to do this. And so it's, you know, it's all love of the game and love of the people you're around. And so that's it very it special. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. Well, Drew, thank you so much. Um, enjoy the rest of the summer. Stay fit and uh, can't wait to watch you play again, uh, whether with Ademar on the national team or against me uh, for, for a year or so. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was great. And likewise, if there's anything I can do to help you guys, I'm more than happy to do that. And you've always got a place in Spain or L.A. or wherever I am to stay. So Perfect. thanks again for everything. Thanks so much, Drew. All right. Take see care, Benny. Thanks. Bye-bye.